All right, man. Brandon Jones, brother. Long time no see. Thank you. Thanks for having me, man. Well, it's so cool to have you on the show because and the, the fun thing about this podcast for me is like I get to meet all these cool people that I've never met before. Right. But then also it gives me a great excuse to reconnect with old <laughs> friends. And so I was looking through Facebook the other day and you were doing one of your, I guess it was one of your personal defense like right. uh, mm -hmm. instructions or, or something like that on Facebook. I'm like, why have I not had Brandon on the show to talk about Tyler Kung Fu and fitness? Uh, let me get my phone off to talk about Tyler Kung Fu and fitness and what you've got going on. I mean, this in every way fits into my mantra of improve always and always and health and wellness and, and then also entrepreneurship. I mean, you cover all of it. And the coolest thing, I mean, Brandon, you're the only guy that I probably know that makes their living in martial arts. That's true. <laughs> and has for a long time. Long time. So here's where I think we should start this. Let's start right there. How did your love of martial arts begin? And then just what has the journey look like that's taken you for? I mean, how long have you been doing this now? Since 1982. Dude, that's incredible. <laughs> so, all right. And, and by the way, so be, uh, uh, aside from Chuck Norris, who also makes his living in martial arts, yeah. so you're, you're kind of the only guy that I really that I pay any attention to in this regard. <laughs> so, all right. So how did that journey start, man? So it's it's a, a great a great comparison you did there with, with Chuck. He's, well, you kind of look like Chuck Norris, dude. That's what everybody tells you're me. You're younger, but you kind of look like Yeah, he's the man. He's the man. So... <laughs> Of course, back in the 70s, David Carradine walking barefoot across yep. the sand in Kung Fu, my mom and I used to watch that all the time, and I think that sparked it. Yeah. That. And then just growing up, and for whatever reason, I just had this, this passion for Kung Fu, or just martial arts. I didn't know that it was Kung Fu. I had this passion for martial arts. Then Chuck Norris hits the scene, and here's this guy that is just awesome, and that I just really looked up to yeah. and then wanted to model everything that I could about him. Then I met my teacher, my Kung Fu teacher, who happened to be in Texas. He's from originally from D.C. And he happened to be in Texas visiting a family, doing a theater workshop. His, his passion was martial arts and theater. So, uh, he worked Broadway and did a lot of things, but he was here visiting. And... Of all places, little Marshall, Texas, where I grew up, he came to visit, and I took this theater class. And he said, hey, you know, you should do Kung Fu with me. Well, his name is Raymond Fogg, and I never believed him. I said, ah, he's tricking. He doesn't know Kung Fu. And then next year, me and my buddy see him doing a demo at what they used to call Stagecoach Days in Marshall. I'm not sure if they still do it, but he was doing a Kung Fu demo. And I said, whoa, that's Mr. Fogg. That's him. So we were like 11 at the time. Ran up to him, started taking from right then. Really? I mean, man, just and it, I just immersed myself in it. Yeah, so 11 years old. All right, so, and did, did it just so happen, because you mentioned, you know, watching Kung Fu, and he happened to be, a, and what is, what is the actual term for him? Is he a Kung Fu master? Is that what it's, what's the term? For my teacher? Yeah. For, yes, yeah. He's what's considered a grand master. So think in terms of a family. So you have okay. a father, a grandfather, a great-grandfather. Okay. So basically, in the Kung Fu world, whenever you're a student and then you get students like me, that makes my teacher a grandmaster. Got it. Or sorry, a master. So okay. he's like a grandfather. And okay. then when my students get students, then he becomes a grandmaster. So it's over time. It graduates like a family. Okay. Now, this may be a silly question, but... You know, considering there is a lineage there that you can trace, Correct. how important is it in the world of Kung Fu that you know who your 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 family tree Very is? Very important. Okay. Yeah, right. that's like the credentials. Really? That gives you credentials. So many people have seen Kung Fu Panda. Yeah. They had all those little animals on there. Believe it or not, those animals were all legit styles of Kung Fu, except, of course, the panda. Okay. But there's a praying mantis that's in Kung Fu Panda. That's the style that I do. It's a okay. very rare style. I'm probably one of probably less than a thousand sifus in the world really? that do Praying Manus Kung Fu. And I'm ninth generation from Wong Long who founded Praying Manus Kung Fu. Really? So it's unbelievable. So yeah, lineage means a lot. So you know your teacher, his teacher, his teacher, his teacher, and you work your way up. Okay, and so tell me about what in the heck 
praying mantis is, what makes it kind of a niche. It sounds like it's, you said it's kind of a rare form. It so is. What, what sets it apart and just kind of fill me and this audience in on what, 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 in, what entails the praying mantis lineage of, sure. of, of martial arts. So as I mentioned with Kung Fu Panda, Kung Fu styles are actually modeled after the movements of animals. Okay. So you have your tiger, your crane, your snake, all that's legit styles. Okay. So the Kung Fu masters, we're talking, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, would watch these. They were monks already, and they would watch these animals during their meditation. They'd watch how a lion moved, how a tiger moved, how it would defend itself, what it would do. So the story is that Wang Long, who created the praying mantis system, would, was being defeated by his Kung Fu brothers. They were already all Kung Fu students in the Shaolin Temple or in various temples, and they would practice Kung Fu together. Well, they would have competitions, friendly competitions, and he was losing to his Kung Fu brothers all the time. Okay. So the legend is he's like, i got to figure out a way to get these guys. So he was out under a tree doing his meditation, noticed a praying mantis insect grappling with a cicada. And he watched how the praying mantis grabbed him, hooked him, wouldn't let him go, clung to him, and then, of course, devoured him. Ah. So he said, okay, I figured out how I could figure out how to, how to hook, how to grab, how to use my hands like a mantis. And then he started studying. He says, but the mantis has weak legs, has great hooking hands, but has weak legs. Okay. So what can I combine that? So then he started watching a monkey. How does a monkey hop? How does a monkey move? So really, it's comprised of two different, one insect, one animal, mantis hands, monkey footwork. Really? So he combined that together. Okay. And so like a mantis fights, it's very in close. Mm-hmm. It uses a lot of grabs, a lot of joint locks, a lot of holds, and then it just takes them out. Very cool. Okay, now you said that all these guys were like monks mm-hmm. at first. So is martial arts is the the genesis of it as a form of meditation and kind of oneness with nature, or was it a defense mechanism? Was it an offense? Like, where did it come from? And and also, and take that into just the mindfulness aspect of martial arts, which I know has a lot to do with the practice in general. So just kind of like, what, why did it, what was it originally for? So one of the stories is kind of comical, and I mean, it may be true, is the monks were whether they're uh, Taoist monks or Taoist monks or whatever religion they were in, or not really religion, just a form of belief that they were studying, they would use these various exercises to stay awake. Okay. Okay. Okay, Now that's, this is kind of the funny, as funny story. So they would be, they were building their bodies, as you mentioned, getting strong. They also knew they had to defend themselves against bandits and various people storming the temple, trying to steal from them, doing whatever. So they started, training with each other learning self-defense and really i tell everybody kung fu or tai chi which is what i also do is like slow moving martial arts is really moving meditation and what i mean by that is you're having to think about the moves right for a while you have to think about the next move am i breathing properly am i moving properly am i holding my hands properly then of course then it just becomes second nature you don't have to think about it again so it's is it stemmed in in religion i think it it was used to just hone your body and keep yeah. you mentally sharp. Yeah. Of course, I don't get into the religious aspect. That's not sure. who I am. Right. But my gosh, look at look at the awesomeness of it. Look yeah. at what you can the, the physical and the mental and, and right. the benefits you can get from it. Yeah, one of the things I've started recently, have you ever heard of the five Tibetan rites by chance? I have. Okay. So I was I guess I first heard about it from this guy, Brian Scott. He wrote this book called Reality Revolution. And he mentioned the five Tibetan rites, and it was first mentioned, I guess, in the West by some guy that had been traveling over, obviously, in the Far East, and he came across these monks Mm -hmm. that were really youthful, and they they practiced this specific form of breathing exercise, these different moves called the five Tibetan rites. And, of course, there's actually six rites, but the sixth is to do with maintaining celibacy, in which I'm not interested in (laughs) as a married man. And so, but I now do the five Tibetan rites every single morning. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things that really excited me about our conversation is because mm-hmm. I'm learning much more about uh, mindfulness, breath work, oh, yeah. you know, both from, the, from you know, uh, 
as forms of martial arts, the Tibetan rites, uh, Wim Hof. You know, it's, yes, it's, yes. It's so much more attention is being given to the physiological benefits of breath work and just movements. So how have you found, and I've got so many questions, Brandon. I'm going to take <laughs> this all over the place. Just bear with me. But I know with Tai Chi, I've seen that as kind of a way to better, like you say, it's like mobile or, for lack of a better description, meditation. Mm -hmm. So what benefits can people expect when they start to use some of these practices as you've seen it? And by the way, it tends to help with like older people as well, if I'm not mistaken. Oh yeah. So several ways to answer that. So first of all, let's, let's talk about mindfulness. I've had a lot of people say, well, what does that really even mean? The best description that I came about just on a personal journey is being very aware of my body Mm -hmm. as an athlete and you know you were an athlete you you tend to notice things about your body more than the average person you know your knee hurts but you know it's not really an injury it's just tired so you push through whereas if you have an injury you're like ah that's an injury so as athletes you have that mindfulness already so what tai chi does is it or just breathing in general through the martial arts or different various ways it brings you more mindful so as you learn to take that deep breath we in tai chi we breathe in through the nose it warms and filters the air and then you take it out through the mouth and we visualize it circulating mm-hmm. through the body and coming back so it that gives you a visual i even have my students play a little mind thing i say okay you guys close your eyes think about it. every time you breathe in it's like heat, like red, breathing in. When you breathe out, it's blue. It's cold and old air. You breathe in, you breathe out. So it gives them a mental mm-hmm. aspect. Yeah. So yeah. become very mindful of just their breath. Yeah. We don't think about breathing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it becomes very mindful. And then the way we stand. So are we standing on one leg? Well, guess what? Now you're very mindful of all those muscles, all those stabilization muscles working to maintain your posture and balance. Mm-hmm. Now you understand your feet. I never knew I had muscles in my feet. I mean, that sounds silly, yeah. but you know what I mean? Absolutely. People don't understand that it's all connected from your toes all the way up into your neck. Right, right. So it really, div- and then you get strong. There's various postures where you're holding your hands up, you're looking up, you're standing on one leg, you're low in like a squat. Yeah. Holding that position for a long time. So then you get very strong. Yeah. What I call like a microwave workout from the inside out. Yeah, yeah. I love that. And that's one of the things that I'm learning that, you know, I've said this on this podcast many times before. The more I learn, the 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 less I realize I actually know. Yes, you know, it's like it's it's wading further, further out into the ocean. And one of the things that I love as I've started to, and one of the reasons I was, I was excited to talk to you today is that understanding the human body and the anatomy and learning those muscles that we don't think about. Mm-hmm. And, you, and it's it's interesting. So I recently had. You know, my left behind my left knee, I started feeling some severe pain, and like I, it was like really slow movement. And I and Jimlin was kind of laughing at me because I I bragged that I never have aches and pains, even though I'm 47, I'm pushing 50, but I've been very blessed that I, I'm taking care of myself and I don't have the aches and pains. But this was severe, and, I, and so she got in the bed with me the other night, and I had an ice pack in my pillow and my leg on a pillow. And I was like, look, you understand, this isn't just a little ache i know that this is something different now it turned out it was like jumper's knee which i had never heard of until i did all the research and realized mm-hmm. well i had just done a recent exercise of one-legged box jumps there i'm not been doing but <laughs> i could tell and then one of the things too brandon that uh that i started doing during my meditation is and this may be completely goofy and i don't even think i read this it's just but i just started thinking about it. it's like i will speak to the muscles starting down the ends of my toes and just at least think about everything just to, to match the my neurotransmitters with the muscle for a little bit to say, you know, I'm thankful for my knees. I'm thankful for your calf muscles. Yep. I expect certain performance out of you today, you know. And, yeah. And so <laughs> and so I, that's what I love about the idea of martial arts is that it, it puts you in such tune with your body because I, I, I think so many people – they they have this body, but it's kind of me with my car. As long as it turns on and I've changed the oil and it's got gas in that's it, all you need. That's all I need. Mm-hmm. But with your body, I want to have a better fundamental understanding of oh yeah of how it works. All right, so now just going back to just some of the cool geeking out on martial arts right. in general. <laughs> all right, tell me what some of the differences are. So we were talking about Joe Rogan before we before we started, yeah. and uh, Rogan's a big jujitsu guy, yeah. right? Okay, uh-huh. so. 
what's the difference between kung fu jujitsu and why might one kind of is there different origins and why might one decide kung fu and is karate Mm -hmm. something completely separate just right kind of educate me on just martial arts as a general term so it's really like art okay meaning you have to you have to really find what floats your boat so to speak you really got to find where your passion is so being a young kid i'd taken karate as a kid that was just kind of a little summer thing but then when i met my teacher i didn't really understand that he knew kung fu i didn't know the difference i I, I didn't care Mm -hmm. i just wanted to do martial arts would if he had been a karate master guess what i would probably be doing karate right now right but when he did kung fu and I just immerse myself into it. So first of all, let me back up. Kung Fu is a Chinese martial art. It's the oldest martial art there is. All other arts derive from that, according, okay. according to history. Okay. So praying mantis is a lot of joint locks, a lot of up-close fighting. Think of as a Western boxing, but involving grabs and elbows and knees and kicks and, okay. and throws. Jiu-Jitsu's expertise, obviously, is wrestling and being on the ground and rolling. And I love that stuff. I love all martial arts. I do. I've trained. I've had the privilege of training with so many masters and so many people across the world doing different martial arts. Kung Fu is just my thing. Got it. I just move like a bug, and that's just the way it is. That's what I've done. But so, but I run everything through that filter. So if I go, to, so I have a buddy who's a professional. He's he's a BJJ uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt, but he's also a Kung Fu master, and he trains a lot of fighters. I train with him, visit with him a lot, and, and we and we talk about the various things. And and but I but everything he shows me, I run it through my Mantis filter, if that makes sense. How would I deal with that? How would I react to that? So we talk a lot about that. Same thing with karate and Taekwondo. Taekwondo, their expertise is kicking. Have to have a lot of space. Kung Fu, we're about 40% kicks, or Mantis anyway, about 40% kicks, about 60% hands. Okay. And we don't need a lot of space, very in-close fighters. So you then you take that style and you you can, you know, help people, help women if they're attacked. And what happens if this guy's already on them? What do they do? Right. So you teach them some techniques. And the women sometimes are not comfortable. I don't want to get on the ground. What happens if I fall on the ground? And we teach them how not to fall. But then if you get down there, we teach them how to get out. Yeah. Okay. And deal with it, too. Okay. And what was Bruce Lee? What, what did he do? What did he practice? Because he kind of created his own. So Bruce Lee had a basic uh, or his base in Wing Chun, which is Kung Fu. Okay. He, he there There's a huge popular series on Netflix called Ip Man or the movies Ip Man. Okay. And it's about Bruce Lee's teacher. Oh. But he was far a master way before Bruce Lee came into the scene. Okay. But anyway, Jet, but Bruce Lee learned from him Wing Chun. And then as Bruce Lee came to the States, he got it not he got exposed to boxing, wrestling, judo. So in like all of us, he just loves martial arts. Yeah. So he trained with everybody yeah. and then kind of put together his own style, which is called Jeet Kune Do. Okay. But what people don't realize is it's based in Kung Fu, his love. And really before his death, if you look at some of his later interviews, he was circling back to his Kung Fu origin. Okay. He had, he had kind of broke away. He said, let's get away with, let's do away with the unnecessary stuff and stick to the stuff that's just, just pertains to fighting you know defending yourself right but then later before his death he was getting talking about i mean of course he got his degree in philosophy yeah yeah and so he he really understood the philosophy of it all yeah and that's one of the things that i think resonates with me as it relates to martial arts and guys like you and and as i've read about bruce lee is there is a, a deep level of philosophical understanding of of the mindfulness we've been talking about it is truly it's not just a brawler hey here's some tips and tricks on how to you know be a be a badass it's like (laughs) a very thoughtful and and it's using the body in a way that i find really really uh really cool and oh yeah uh, you know it's it's, so and, and talking about that so if someone came in to you and they said look because one of the things I talk about a lot on this pod, podcast is longevity. Mm-hmm. Someone comes in and says, here's the deal. I'm in good shape. I'm in decent shape. And I'm just looking at all different things I can do. I've got mm-hmm. yoga. I've got CrossFit. I've got just whatever the case may be, fill in the blank. And I'm considering some martial arts as part of my protocol. Mm-hmm. What benefit is it to me just – I'm not 
I'm not going to be entering any competitions. Okay. I'm not worried about self-defense necessarily. That's going to be kind of an ancillary. This is more or less just for my health and longevity. What are some of the benefits that a person can expect by pursuing martial arts? Well, first of all, I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to suggest you do Tai Chi and Kung Fu. Okay. I'm going to suggest you do Tai Chi to understand breath, to start understanding the breathing, understanding the postures, and teaching yourself to slow down. Yeah. That's a huge, that's probably my biggest obstacle to teach myself. Can I and, tell you something funny real quick? You yeah, just prompted a thought. Yeah. So every Tuesday morning, I do guitar lessons, mm -hmm. and they're actually I, I stream them live on the YouTube channel with uh, a buddy of mine out in Lincoln, Nebraska, Tim Woosley, and he, that's what he's constantly telling me. Slow, <laughs> and we just had that conversation this morning during my lesson. He's like, "Just go slow," yeah. and he said the same thing. So anyway, you maybe I was like, "Yeah." So I, yeah. I absolutely agree. Yeah. Slowing down is very difficult. Well, I mean, that's even the Navy SEAL mantra: "Slow is smooth, smooth is fast." Yeah. So you learn to draw slowly. You learn to extend that weapon. Yeah. You do it slow, you're going to be able to do it fast. My teacher always told me, "If I can hit you slow, I can hit you fast." Yeah. And so we learn to slow down. So I'm going to put a person in Tai Chi so they understand that. If unless they just really aren't into that. Okay. Then I'm going to tell them Kung Fu is a longevity activity. Yes, we have testing and we have belt testing and things. However, you're not doing it really anymore to step into a ring. You want to have fitness. You want to have fun. You want to have fellowship. Yeah. And that's what we have here at the school. And a good byproduct of that is you can protect yourself and at least get out of a situation. Right, right. And I got to believe that, like, as far as just agility and being remaining pliable, there's got to be some benefit there as well. Oh, definitely. Tai Chi and Kung Fu are one of the – like, they do all these case studies. I read lots of them. And they take Tai Chi and the benefits of it and Kung Fu, and it is the one that – will blend into all other things. So I learned to squat and move in Tai Chi. Well, guess what? Now I'm a better gardener. Mm -hmm. Now I can pick up, yeah. you know, pounds of sacrete or whatever and right. move it across my yard. Now I can lift. I tell the ladies, you know, as we lift, now I can put things up in my cabinet right. that I couldn't before. Right. So it's it's that aspect that, that – and then now on a Kung Fu side, now I'm more aware of my surroundings. Okay. You know, I'm learning in class how to be aware i got multiple attackers. Well, now I'm learning to walk to my car, be aware of what's going on around me, be aware of who's over here, who's over there. You go into a restaurant, I'm aware of who's talking – who is in a heated conversation? Is this couple upset? Is this guy over by the door? Why is this guy standing by the door looking shady? You know, what's going on over here? So it's, it's, it's funny. I tell my clients all the time. It's a little bit being like James Bond. Yeah. It's where you walk into rooms, you scan, you figure out exits and everything. So just that aspect of it. And that's a whole other realm. Yeah. But just Kung Fu really does that for you. Well, and sitting here, we're in your, uh, in your studio which it's uh, the the cool thing about Tyler Kung Fu and Fitness at this point, man, it's a Tyler institution. You've been how long have you been here now? Nineteen ninety six. Yeah, <laughs> dude. I mean, that is crazy, and it's yeah. and it's so. I love the fact that it's kind of like old school. I mean, it kind of takes you back. Like this is like what you'd expect in Karate Kid, you know? Yeah. So strip center. Here's the here's the studio. What are people getting when they come here? I mean, what, for example, you mentioned the self-defense and understanding the awareness, which I think is so important in this day and age. So let's say that, again, I told you about the, the uh, hypothetical, just, hey, I'm in it for longevity. Mm -hmm. But let's say I'm somebody, I want to learn to better protect myself. Mm -hmm. I, you know, what can they learn at Tyler Kung Fu and Fitness? Well, for starters, we're going to, you mentioned the tradition. That's what, that's what praying man is. That's what Kung Fu is. I'm, I'm a very traditional teacher. I teach the the basics of Kung Fu, and then you bring it to today's time. How do we deal with a gun? How do we deal with somebody trying to harm us in that manner? Right. So we have all that. I, I can teach you how to disarm somebody, but I also want to teach you how I know that. I teach, And you learn that through the various forms, which is just a series of movements connected together, one after the other. To get that in your body, in order to disarm somebody, you have to have all this already put in your body before you get to that so your body knows how to react got it you got to know how to stand so that you maintain your balance okay. you got to know how to grab so that your arm doesn't get broken mm -hmm. so all this stuff comes from practice through the forms so you're going to learn that 
you're going to learn to put that in there just through repetition. Okay. And then you're going to learn how to hold your hands, how to hold your feet, how to breathe. It gets yeah. back to the breath. How do yeah. I stay breathing? Because if we're able to keep our body breathing, then your mind isn't totally in a fight or flight mode. You can kind of almost trick it. Yep, yep. And, and I mean, you were a football player. You remember before that game, man, you're amped. Yep. Mm-hmm. And you got to breathe a little bit, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and move yeah. to get yourself – in, in that mindset you know it's it, that's the in James Nestor's book uh, breath mm-hmm. that is the point he makes it's the one the one thing that we must I think it was in that book that he's like the one thing we all must have is breath air it, yeah. it's that you we can kind of overcome pain and let's say that you're going somewhere with a you, know, you break a leg or whatever but without air, you're done. Yeah. And maintaining that breathing and that calm. And then, you know, uh, one of the things that I do, and I'd like to know kind of what your morning protocol is or just your daily protocol for that matter. Mm-hmm. You know, box breathing, which is, again, referring to the Navy SEALs, that's what they do. You know, the four counts in, hold it for four, out four, yeah. hold it for four. I've implemented that. And I can tell you that breath work has had such a profound impact just on – not just in that moment, mm-hmm. but in preparing me for the rest of the day. Oh, man. You know, yeah. just having that consciousness. And it does, it almost like, this is going to sound so weird, Brandon, but <laughs> after I had started meditating for a while and doing some breath work, I noticed trees in a way I never had. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like your brain does just stop to take note of beauty, of just kind of just whatever's a, the textures it's it's really cool. So, what are you doing to to prime your body and your mind on a, on the daily? Kind of take me through the especially someone that's so steeped in this uh, in, in such a deep and historical philosophy as as kung fu and the martial arts that you practice. What does your day look like whenever you're preparing? So, with with the breath, you talked about the the in for and out for. Yeah. So, with tai chi and really with kung fu, instead of you count for four, hold it, and then let. It, Really is we we breathe in to a count of four, okay, and then breathe out to a count of four, okay, to really slow it down. So you may be breathing for about four seconds. You're inhaling and then you're exhaling for four seconds. So it's really not holding the breath necessarily. Okay. It's Got just it. keeping it fluid. So I, I do a lot of qigong, which is you talked about the. Um, the remind me which said the four Tibetan, the five Tibetan rice, five Tibetan rice. Yes, yeah. yeah, my mind went blank. So. It's it's really a lot like qigong. Qigong is very qigong is basically I'll put it in a very simple term. It's like tai chi without moving, okay. Without without covering distance. Now you may move, but you're standing standing in one spot, okay. For qigong, so a lot of breathing exercises. A lot of the breath now that's popular. A lot of the breathing exercises are based on qigong. Okay. So okay. it all stems all comes back to that. So I do a lot of tai chi. Of course, I'm. Like you said, I'm blessed enough to do this for a living. Yeah. And so I'm able to do all my Tai Chi classes every week, do about four or four or five, five a week. And then we do about, I do about 16, 17 to 20 classes a week okay. of Tai Chi and Kung Fu combined. Wow. So I'm able to do that yeah. with the class. And I'm on personal training. I always got to do my Kung Fu forms to keep my keep myself sharp and crisp. I still, I still uh, run bleachers at the Gorman track. I love doing that just to get outside. And of course I lift with a little bit of weights just to stay toned yeah. and everything, stay strong. Yeah. And, uh, I, and when I go on vacation, I still work out. That's cause if, cause now I get to work out on my own. You don't yeah. have to, don't have to do it for other people. Right. And, and right. I love it. Yeah. You know, one of the things you just mentioned there that I was listening to Peter Atia yesterday, and there's been more and more research showing the benefits for longevity in actual having strength. But yeah. there's there, and it is a fine line. But it's more important to have strength versus larger muscles. Yes, right. Yeah. And one of the things that about most of those that are, with the exception of the one guy that was Bruce Lee's nemesis all the time, that bulky guy. Yeah. I can't remember what his name was, but he was always kind of like the the nemesis to Bruce Lee that would show up. And I think he showed up in a when he was really young. He showed up in a, a Van Bond, Damme movie. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. He was the bad guy. In that. <laughs> it was in, always in the blood bad sport. Guy. There you go. <laughs> but there's but most of these guys are just incredibly lean. But then you watch the strength that they have, like to be able to break the bricks mm-hmm. or to you know to just focus and break the board. It's like this incredible strength on a pound for pound basis yep. that. And so I got to believe that the longevity aspect of this 
correlates in that regard as well. It does. And then learning how to channel the waste yeah. into that punch. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to slug it out with a 200 pound dude. I'm just yeah. not, right. I can't afford to do that. Right. So where do you, I have to, I tell my students all the time, you got to have precision over power. Yeah. I got to hit him in certain points, point in areas of his body. So and then I get out of there. Yeah. I'm not going to hang out. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about that. Okay. Cause I think that's kind of cool. So let's say that I am out with my wife mm-hmm. and some big jackass just comes and mm-hmm. starts messing with me. What is a move that other than run, which I think that's what I'm supposed to do. If it's a if guy, you can. That, that just, just get out of there. If just run. Can, yeah. That's a smart thing to do. But let's say I got to have a move. What do I do to best defend myself? No weapons involved at this point. Just right. I, I want to get this guy to know, don't mess with me. What do I do? So um, now you got to realize that this, this can do some damage. Okay. Okay. But you, you, can, you can tailor it okay. to where you do the least amount or the maximum amount. So the palm is your best weapon. Okay. I like the palm. The re- reason, most people swing with their fist. Right. I have students who work in the, their ER physicians. They tell me two people come to the hospital in a fight, the winner and the loser. Yeah. The loser comes with a broken jaw. The winner comes with a broken hand. Yeah. So palms, okay. much better. Don't want to break my knuckles. So the palm is your best weapon. Having said that. It's a big guy. That palm is coming out. You're very quick. It's either going to hit the nose, bust the nose, which what does that do? Cloud his vision. Can't see. Hit the chin. That's where it's a little more dangerous. You hit the chin. His neck's going to pop back. Could cause a hangman's break, so you got to be careful with that. But it pops the neck back, and it can knock him clean out. Okay. Clean well, out. See, it's, never, it's, see, all, it's interesting you say it because I always thought about that because I have a weak wrist anyway. I had surgery on it whenever I was in high school. So I've always thought if I ever have to punch somebody, I'm probably going to hurt my wrist more yeah. than that. So just the palm, just to the nose, yeah. bah, Just going right in there. Okay. Now, you know, you want to have practiced that. Yeah. But then understand, it may knock most people out, Yeah. but it may, bah, it may break his nose. And, I mean, I've, I've fought guys who they're – mean right the more pain you cause them the better they get right so right. that's a different breed but when you hit somebody like that in the face i mean you react I mean, you and i both have kids you've been holding the baby and they accidentally bump your face yeah you're like oh man that's a baby's head no yeah yeah so just think of that hitting you and then if you're coming in with a palm with all you got okay makes a lot of sense yeah all right so they cut they pull a knife is there a move I need? Woo! Yeah, knives are much scarier than guns. Um, so with a knife, you gotta, you've got to, you pretty much are gonna have to tell yourself, okay, I'm gonna get cut. Okay. And then you you use once you commit to attacking, you have to continue to attack until the threat is neutralized, until you okay. have them knocked out or whatever. Disarming them, you're probably not going to be able to. It's that's only in the movies. I mean, you can. I know lots of disarming techniques, but in the heat of it, when they're slashing and thrashing, I've tried it full speed. It's much more difficult oh, God. than it looks at on on in the movies. So you have to minimize the damage. You have to learn to turn your arms in so that your forearms are getting cut as opposed to where okay. the veins are. Makes sense. Tucking your chin, protecting your neck, keeping your body sideways so that your vital organs aren't exposed. Okay. Turning sideways, what we call blading yourself. And then you have to, again, precision over power. I've got to attack him in the eyes, take his eyesight away. I've got to hit him in the throat, cut his airway. Right. I've got to take his knee out so he can't walk. Okay. Things like that is what's going to immobilize that okay and then i got to think that in the, like you mentioned the heat of the moment i've got to if i'm someone that who can stay calm in that situation i gotta believe that's an advantage big too. advantage I, mean, I don't know that i could hypothetically i think okay i just try to breathe it stay, but man that's well that's where training takes over yeah yeah of course we're going to be scared to death but with the training you've done it so much yeah. That's where the training is going to take over. Okay. And that's where you just have to rely on your training. Okay. And your breathing and everything will be hooked together. But guess what? Until that moment, you've got years and years and years and years of practice. But then people say, well, what if I can't do Kung Fu for years and years? Then I guarantee within six weeks, you're going to see a massive change in your body and the way you think and the way you move, the way you react, the way you respond. And, and a funny story, when I was in high school, I learned very quickly, well, it only took one time, that I could not... I could no longer go to haunted houses. 
Really? You know, so <laughs> yeah. so you go so you go to haunted houses as kids. Just a natural and, reaction. Yeah, and and so we were at the the haunted house at the uh, state fair in Louisiana. Okay. Because I lived in Marshall, so we're not go. We go with a youth group, and we're going through there. And I've been doing kung fu for maybe a couple of years, and we're going through. And this is back in the day when they could grab you and stuff. And it, it's all black, pitch black. My girlfriend's behind me. I'm in the front. Everybody's screaming. And this hand comes out and grabs me. Well, I react and I throw the guy. And his feet go up. And we, he kicks the curtain. The curtains come down <laughs> and the walls come down. And the lights come on and they shut it down. And get it. So I learned real quickly you can't. Well, see, <laughs> and like, you know, uh, Cameron Poe in that that cinematic masterpiece con air you know he got convicted you know he had to go to jail because he was technically a lethal weapon so you probably got yourself banned from the haunted house i did actually there brandon jones <laughs> you know yeah so so kids martial arts can have it's it's downside as well that's true something you told me that i had no clue was a thing that i think is very cool was how was it the uh, was it Tai Chi or Kung Fu that was helping with Parkinson's patients that you're working with? Well, uh, Tai Chi, of course, can help with the bru- the breathing and okay. the slow movement. Now, this is where my training kind of takes a different little side turn. So, growing up as a kid, I was best friends with a guy named Frankie McConnell, okay. good buddy of mine, and he's also a martial artist out in California. And his dad was George Foreman's personal photographer. Oh, wow. So George Foreman from Marshall. Yep. So guess what? Wherever George went, Mr. McConnell had to go because he's a personal photographer. So guess what? He took us along. So we would go in George Foreman's barn and watch him just train, and he would hit that bag. He had this chain that connected the top of his barn. He hooked that bag, and the whole barn rattled. <laughs> Ali even said he had never been hit by anything harder than that. Right. So I, I, was, I was mesmerized by boxing, too. So fast forward. I'm doing my Kung Fu training, had an opportunity to have a lot of buddies who were boxers, and I trained with them, and we did a lot of fitness, and I watched them. So I always enjoyed that type of workout. Came across what's called rock steady Boxing when I was at this trade show, martial arts trade show out in Vegas. Rock steady Boxing. Started talking to them. They were, it's this new study coming along, how they had helped Parkinson's patients, help these folks who have lost the mobility, mm-hmm. have lost the ability of mobility. Yeah. And... They are this form of boxing is creating new neural pathways mm-hmm. that they can use understanding hand eye coordination, yeah, how yeah. to get the signal to the, So, I just I was really mesmerized. So, I started studying it. A friend of mine who is um, a neurologist, Dr. Lisk, he contacted me and said, Hey, I got these patients, I really like you, you know, to turn them on to you. And so, I um collaborated with him a little bit we talked about it and then I went and got the training and so now I've been doing it since 19 and I've seen these people's lives completely change wow it's unbelievable it makes a lot of sense because I was reading where research has shown that like okay they're talking about the plasticity of the brain mm-hmm. and there was a some research that was done I can't remember the study exactly where they would have two different uh, uh sets uh, uh, of experiment you know you know experimentees some would lift weights some would actually not lift weight but just go through the motion and some would just and i think it was like 30 minute exercises of like mm-hmm. curls bench press whatever and they would do a 30 minute exercise weights no weights just the motion and then one just the thought just would think of doing the exercise and the ones that just did the thinking, it was just neurological. I want to say their strength increases were something like 30%. Wow. And then saying, obviously, the greatest were those who were actually lifting the weights and then those going through the motion. But you, they actually proved that just exercising the neuro pathway to the muscle yeah. by just imagining yourself. And so I got to believe that, that what you just said makes a lot of sense. And oh, again, yeah. it goes into that ign- ign- initiating the neurological aspect of movement and form that Correct. makes the, the difference. Very Correct. cool. Very it's, cool. So we, I, I teach them how to do jabs, hooks, crosses, uppercuts, where you're talking about somebody that probably hasn't lifted their hands 
if they're if they're further in their diagnosis. Now I've got, yeah. so it's all broken down in in levels. Levels one, two, or three. Right. Levels one meaning very high functioning, probably just diagnosed within six months to a year. Okay. Really, very little outward signs. Right. That they have Parkinson's, unless you know what to look for. Phase two would be meaning a little bit more, maybe perhaps a little more shaking, a little more trembling, a little more um, stuttering in their stepping. Mm -hmm. Phase three, and of course it progresses. I've got some guys who came in as threes, and now they're twos. Yeah. Just because they couldn't, they, their, their brain wouldn't tell their arm to hit that bag. Right. And now they're doing it. Now, of course, they're still on their medicines. They're still following doctor's orders. They're doing everything the doctor's telling right. them. However, just the quality of life that they're getting back. And I've had one woman tell, tell me, she goes, you gave, well, not me, but this class gave me my husband back. Wow. So you talk about a ministry. She said before I, I, I had shifted into that aspect of uh, I had to be his mother. Mm -hmm. Very very difficult on a, on a wife sure. and she could, but now I've got my husband back. Wow. So that right there was worth it. Yeah. Nothing else happens. That one thing was worth doing the class. That's powerful. And that's, that's one of the things that's one of the reasons why I want to bring that up is because I want people to know that, you know, Tyler Kung Fu and fitness and what I know about you and through the history of this and martial arts in general mm -hmm. Is it's not just for some you know the like you make the movie about Ralph Macho the Karate Kid who's trying to overcome being the weak little kid that's getting picked right. on, but there's more to it than that. Yeah. It's it's you know for, it is a form of absolute exercise, mental awareness, longevity. There's so many benefits. Oh yeah. That you know that come along with martial arts and that you can do right here at Tyler Kung Fu. And yeah, yeah, and and you know you mentioned Karate Kid. I think the reason I love that original movie so much and, th and the one that it resonates with so many people is it was the whole wax on, wax off thing. It was more than just protecting yourself. Yeah. You know, he, he brought Daniel San from being a squirmy little kid into yeah. at least having some confidence. Yeah. And so, yeah, Kung Fu is, that permeates that whole confident building yeah. and everything. Yeah. Now, one of the things I want to talk about because uh, – I deal with a lot or talk and deal with, I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and rarely going back to where this conversation started. Do you find someone that from the time you're 11 years old, you find a passion Yeah. and, in, and it's in martial arts, unless you're an actor, unless you're going to go on to competition. And even if you went to the Olympics, it's hard. You're probably not going to make your living unless you're right. an instructor of some sort. You have been able to match your passion and your purpose with your vocation, and that's one of the things that I constantly talk about. I swear, I tell you know we both have children; they mm -hmm. they grew up together. I tell the girls all the time: girls, find something that you would do for free. Yes, and if you can get paid for it, that's then, a benefit. Then you're wealthier than most, than yeah. probably ninety nine percent of the people you'll ever run into. Yep. Uh, how important, Brandon, has it been for you to stick to your guns? And even in the, the good times, the bad, to say, this is my journey. This is my, this is my mission. I'm going to stay, at, stay in it. I mean, how have you maintained that? You know, I mean, you don't seem like a guy if you had to go, like my past, if you had to go sell real estate tomorrow, I think you'd be miserable. You know? I would. I, 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 I tell my wife all the time, I haven't had a real job in 25 years. I say the same thing, man. <laughs> I say the same thing. Yeah. And so that's what carries me through. In the comments, like the woman tell me, you, you gave me my husband back. Yeah. Things like that really fuel your fire. Now, of course, some of my, sometimes my days are 15 hours long. Yeah. Yes, it gets tiring. And is it more tiring now than when I was 35? Probably, you know, but it's, it's, it's still a passion. It's still what I love to do. And, and every now and then when I get tired or whatever, I'm like, wait a minute, dude, you're doing what nobody else, or very few people get to do, Yeah, get, yeah. To, get to earn a living at it. Yeah. And that's one of the things. So I, one of my favorite books of all time, I mention almost every episode these days, is uh, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. It was the inspiration for a book that I, uh, that I have coming out here pretty soon. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what Viktor Frankl, who actually was taken away to the Nazi concentration camps, he was actually in one of the death camps, he was in Auschwitz, he should not have been alive. And he created this idea of logotherapy, which logo it actually translates to meaning and finding meaning and purpose in your life, in your moments, no matter how bad, the good, the bad, 
and we both, you know, we, we know we've dealt with struggles and we all do. Mm-hmm. And it's finding, it's not life happening to you. It's your life and it's happening. So take responsibility for your actions. And in that moment, and when you find that meaning, then, you know, it sounds to me like, like Nietzsche said, he who has a big enough why can endure almost any how. Yeah. And when you know what your why is, and we know what your purpose is, then, you know, you can be a professional kung fu yeah. master, <laughs> you know, and make a living in spite of the 15 hour days and just the, uh, the challenges that it presents. So kudos, man. I, I admire the heck out of that. Yeah. It's, it's such a blessing from God. I mean, I succeeded in spite of myself Yeah, and you Don't know, we all, <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, you, so my Kung Fu teacher way back when said, Hey, you know, you ought to look at opening up a school. Well, he never, my teacher never did it act as his own living. I mean, he had other jobs. Yeah. And so for me to conceive that you can do that full time, I, I couldn't conceive it. Yeah. Couldn't see it. So my buddy John Chang and I grew up together, and he's a physician out in California, and he was seeing other martial artists out there make a living at it. And he calls me, and he goes, I think you can do this, man. He goes, here. So we kind of got a game plan and, and, and a lot of support from family and spouse and everybody and, and getting it out there. And it's, it's, it's the, those – and I had, a, I had a client one time tell me – this was early on when I first opened the school. I was training him one day, and – he was a, f- a physician also. And the only reason I mentioned that he's a physician is, is he had a different insight to things. And he told me, he said, you, he goes, I can tell you're doing what God called you to do. Mm. And that's really when I first opened the business. And that really has struck with me. Yeah. yeah. And I said, yeah. And so you, what was that movie? Chariots of Fire. When he yep. said, as he runs, he feels God's presence. Yeah. When I'm teaching Kung Fu or when I'm doing it personally, I'm in God's presence. Wow. I feel that. There's only other thing you mentioned to write. The only, the only other thing I feel that way is when I'm writing as well. So yeah. you know that feeling. Absolutely. Very cool. Yeah. Talk about, I, I, I didn't know that until we talked on the phone the other day that you are writing now and you're writing some children's books or teen books, right? Yeah. yeah talk yeah. about those. Tell us about those. So that's another 25 year journey. Okay. So, you know, obviously it's martial arts yeah. related. Yeah. So it is, it's just a, in a nutshell, it's a dog who is a, a spy and he's a Kung Fu master. Okay. So it's, um, I'm very fortunate. I have a, a literary agent at a, at a writer's house, a big literary agent. So blessed that God turned me on to him and he's working with me on some revisions so that he can then sell the book to publishers Mm -hmm. so if it was sold right now it's still two years away from being in the bookstore yeah it's it's just that long process as you know but it's it's just been a wonderful journey and so it's uh it's a dog who through genetically testing by the cia was created to be the super soldier dog and then the bad guys find out and then one of the agents is killed and then the, the dog has to escape and meets this 12 year old boy who happens to be the son of one of the CIA agents, and then he helps develop this dog, and then the bad guys come after him. There's a team of assassin ninja cats that are after him. So it's, it's Of all, course it's the awesome. cats are the bad guys. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. Any listeners, if you're cat people out there, no, <laughs> cats are the bad guys. But they're cool bad guys. They're <laughs> okay. ninjas. Because well, of course. If, if there was any animal that's going to be a ninja, a cat a would cat be A cat would be a ninja. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, very cool. And just as a question, what is a ninja? I mean, I know it's an, I know it's like an assassin. It's like more of a, uh, but that's something I didn't even ask you about. What, tell me just a little bit of a history on ninjas. That's for my curiosity. So that's Japanese. Okay, and it's the art of ninjutsu. Okay, so it's really it's it, it is a fighting art. Okay, but it's really more about stealth. It's it's a combat. Got it. It's more about. It's more about, in a way, kind of like our special ops. I was about to say, so that's like uh, Japanese special forces type deal, but from long, long ago. Way back, way back. And they they would go be sent in to kill, you know, shoguns. They would be sent in to kill... They were assassins. They were sent in to kill. And, you know, Hollywood has kind of made good good ninjas, bad ninjas. Right. Just from what I've read, typically the history was they were pretty all much bad. Okay. Okay. uh, So it's so, I mean, I figured if I'm going to have bad guys, they're going to be cats, they're going to be ninjas too. There you go. All right. Well, Brandon, tell us, uh, tell everybody where they can reach you if they have any interest in learning some of the Tai Chi, Kung Fu, self defense, you know, uh, anything. That plug Tyler Kung Fu and Fitness, man. I want to help. You've taken your time to give me an sure. education on martial arts. The least I could do is plug this incredible school that you have. Well, man. thank you. Well, we've been here since 96, so we're the longest martial arts school here in town. Uh, what a blessing. So we have a YouTube channel that we you know, show forms and 
self-defense techniques so everybody can tap into Tyler Kung Fu and Fitness YouTube channel. Okay. Of course, we're on Facebook, and I put a lot of videos on there. Just find us at Tyler Kung Fu and Fitness on okay. Facebook. And then we're, we're right here on 5th Street across from Posados. Yep. And I tell most everybody, most everybody knows where Posados is. Right. And it's still funny. I've been here 25 years, and people have said, well, I didn't know where you were. So, I mean, you, you never get over that. Right, right. But that's where we are. And we, we train, you know, uh, we have classes four days a week. We have Tai Chi, kickbox, I mean, not kickboxing, but rock steady boxing, and then the Kung Fu class. Awesome. Brandon, this has been every bit as enlightening and as fun as I thought it would. Thank you, brother. Yeah, I appreciate thank you, it, man. man. So good to catch up. And if you're listening on the podcast, please don't forget to check out Tyler Kung Fu and Fitness. I will let, I'll put all this in the show notes as far as the YouTube channel and everything. And if you happen to be watching on the YouTube channel, thank you. Please click subscribe. Please leave some comments. If you have any questions about martial arts, anything for Brandon, put it in the comment section. And until I see you again, Brandon, thank you. Continue to improve always and always. I'm Jason Wright, and I am out. <laughs>